Hey guys, so I've always been a rather curious person by nature. Always excited to learn new things, especially if it's something that piques my interest. I love the hunt for new bits of information, the chase for new topics, and the feeling of discovering some new pieces of lore that really brings our world to life. And I think I can say the realms are a rather interesting place to live, to say the least. But have you ever looked up at the sky and wondered what's out there? It's something we've all seen, but I'm not sure many people actually know precisely what they're looking at. We see these small pinpricks of light dancing above our heads, and we hardly ever think about it. Well, recently I've been digging into some scrolls about the cosmology in which we live, so today I want to share what I've learned. I'm not going to dig too deep into each one of these, but I'm going to give you a cursory understanding of the subjects, and hopefully by the end of it we can all be a little bit more educated about the celestial bodies of realm space. So what is realm space exactly? Well, realm space is the term we use to describe the greater Terillion system and its surrounding environments within just the prime material plane. You may have heard it also called the Sea of Night. Realm space as a whole is everything that exists within this particular crystal sphere. So in the case of realm space, that would be the sun, eight planets and their satellites, and a variety of asteroids, comets, and nebula. And everything in between them is considered wild space. There's actually quite a lot of detail I could go into regarding the crystal sphere itself. But since this is an overview, I think we'll go ahead and dive in, so let's start at the center of our sphere and work our way outwards. Alright, so our first destination at the very center of our sphere is the Sun, or maybe you've heard it go by Sol. So, the Sun is an enormous sphere of fire at the center of our solar system, and the source of light and heat for each and every planet we'll visit today. In fact, the sun is so hot that any closer inspection is quite impossible for any creatures not naturally immune to fire, even if magical aid is employed. The sun's surface is made up of varying areas of molten earth and fluid flame, which is a distinction that only beings from the plane of fire might care about. Some areas called sunspots are somewhat cooler than their surroundings and can be recognized by their darker color. And at other places, one can find massive pillars and loops of flame violently jutting out from the sun's surface, and these can extend for millions of miles. The surface also features hundreds of portals to the elemental plane of fire, allowing the natives of that plane access to the sun's surface whenever they want. One rather odd feature of our sun is the presence of 12 massive spherical magical dead zones that orbit like spokes of a wheel. These are known as Sargassos, and are said to have a diameter of about 100,000 miles each. And I've read these are feared by literally every Spelljammer crew, I suppose mainly because their vessels require magic to move through wild space. Some of the documented inhabitants of the sun include Ifridi, fire elementals, hellions, lava worms, and salamanders. There certainly could be many more, but any attempt to get close to the sun is typically repelled by attacks from its natives, especially the Hellions. So let's move on to the first planetary body. The first planet away from the sun is called Anadia. Seen from Toril, it looks like a small amber-colored orb with green poles. Due to its proximity to the sun, most of the Nadia's surface is too hot and dry to support humanoid life in general. The equatorial regions, which cover about 70% of the total surface area, are wastelands marked by enormous canyons. And these canyons are primarily inhabited by umberhawks and other bestial life forms. The north and south polar regions, however, support a warm and humid climate that's surprisingly favorable to humanoid life. These polar regions, where the halfling population of the planet dwell, are marked by rolling verdant hills that grow richer the closer you move to the poles. 
The central polar regions are generally much more mountainous and have rivers flowing down their surface to irrigate the surrounding areas, but evaporate before they reach too far away from the poles. Beyond the Umberhawks that inhabit the more equatorial regions, there's a rather civilized society of halflings, incredibly intelligent by all accounts and the owners of a constitutional government which divides the regions into 13 counties. There's certainly more we could go into, but since we're just doing an overview, let's move on to the next planet. So up next we have Collier. Collier is the second planet from the sun, and if you're looking at it from here on Toral, it appears to be a rather nondescript gray and white orb. Collier is approximately 60,000 miles in diameter, with a 30-hour day-night cycle and an 8-month long year. It's a gas planet enveloped by 100 mile thick layer clouds. Below this cloud cover, the entirety of the planet is transparent air dotted with countless floating islands that orbit the planet's center of gravity at vastly different altitudes. These islands vary in size, ranging from 5 feet to over 20 miles in length. The vast majority of them are found within 50 and 30,000 miles from the center and typically contain land features one might expect on land, such as lakes, rivers, and hills. Built upon the topmost islands are these extremely tall wooden structures that pierce the planet's upper clouds and are visible from wild space. These reinforced towers serve to safely guide spell jammers arriving at the planet through the clouds to the docking ports below. Collier is generally a warm planet due to its proximity to the sun, Rainstorms happen periodically, during which lightning tends to strike the higher islands much more often than the deeper ones. And for that reason, our inhabitants typically live on the lower islands, and our inhabitants are almost exclusively Aarakocra. But there are also lizard folk and even dragon civilizations on Collier from what I've read. In fact, at the center of the planet, it's said there's a massive island that's inhabited by a huge red dragon that goes by the name Firebrand Flametongue. But very, very few people are allowed to approach the center island without upsetting this fearsome worm. And between you and I, I've heard Elminster even has a hideout near the center of Collier, but I'll not say any more about that. Alright, up next we have Toril, our home. In ages past, Toril was known as Abir Toril until the events of the Spell Plague, which we can cover in more detail in another entry. Toril consists of eight continents, and each of them have their own culture and civilizations that are native to them. They're all pretty well known, but one of the continents goes by the name of Asa and is actually quite unexplored, so there's still more to learn about our beautiful planet. But for now, I'll not bore you with details about Toro. However, we certainly can learn a little about our only satellite, Saloon. Saloon, known as Lyra to its inhabitants, is Toro's one and only natural moon. Seen from Toro, it appears about the size of a human's fist held at arm's length. Saloon is approximately 2,000 miles across and tidally locked with Toro, which means only one side of it is ever visible from Toro. Now, you may not know this, but the visible side of the moon is disguised by a powerful illusion that makes it appear airless, barren, and desolate. This illusion extends about 500 miles above the surface and can only be revealed by a wish spell, and even so, only to the caster. The far side, however, is not obscured by magic, so its true beauty can be seen from space. In fact, every docking port for spell jammers are located on the far side. But before we move on to the next body, I want to briefly mention the Tears of Saloon. These are an asteroid cluster visible from Toril that appear to follow Saloon. They extend quite away from the surface of the moon and are only just bright enough to be viewed at nighttime, and even then, not every night. There are many myths and legend about where they came from, but in reality, the Tears are a rather ordinary asteroid cluster with a rather unusual history. It's said that the Tears were the result of a magic weapon created by Dragonkind to destroy a celestial body known as the Kingkiller Star. But when they fired at the star, 
they accidentally struck Saloon and blasted off all the matter that makes up the tears. Quite interesting to say the least, but let's move on, we still have a lot more to go. The fourth planet from the sun goes by the name Carpri and looks like a sapphire colored orb with large white polar caps. Carpri is a purely water body with a seemingly bottomless ocean and absolutely no land masses as far as we can tell. It spins incredibly fast with a day length of 1 hour and 12 minutes, but a year length of 650 days, so a little more than twice the length of Toral's year. The planet has three distinct regions depending on the latitude. The poles, which are dominated by thick ice caps and perpetually frigid weather, the temperate and tropical areas, which are strictly open ocean, with water transparent enough to allow visibility to a staggering depth, and the equatorial zone, which is dominated by massive patches of seaweed and kelp. Carpri's air is remarkably clean, but its water has a high concentration of bacteria that renders it inadequate to drink unless purified somehow, through magic or mundane means. The polar regions of Carpri are inhabited by some unsurprising cold-loving creatures such as polar bears, yetis, and others, and I've even heard there's a small population of gnomes as well, perhaps the result of an ancient spelljammer ship that crashed there. The equatorial regions are inhabited by extremely large insects and arachnids about twice as large as the specimens here on Toral. But the oceans of the temperate and tropical latitudes are inhabited by several colonies of aquatic elves. They say these colonies were originally from the tractless sea near Evermeet, which is the ocean due west of Faerun. But they had been transplanted to Carpri to ensure the continuation of that specific elven subrace. And speaking of these elven colonies, I've read that Carpri has a massive ancient fortress that was originally placed in orbit to ensure their protection, but it's said the inhabitants were decimated by the Mind Flayers relatively recently, so all that remains are the ghosts of its former defenders. But perhaps that's a tale for another time. Let's move on to Chandos. Chandos looks like a brownish-green smudged orb whose features actually seem to change every few nights. This is primarily because it's another water world, but is also filled with enormous ever-shifting piles of rocks which sometimes grow tall enough to form hundreds of unstable islands. These piles of rocks change randomly every full rotation of the planet, which is about 48 hours so these makeshift islands are constantly sinking and forming new ones. The planet's climate is relatively temperate, especially considering the distance from the sun. However, its lack of an ozone layer causes wide variations in temperature during the day-night cycle. Islands in the polar region are constantly covered in snow, while the islands closer to the equator are perpetually under heavy rainfall. But beyond all that, Chandos appears to be somewhat unremarkable, at least geographically. But if you ever find yourself wanting to explore the surface of Chandos, keep in mind that the wild space in that sector of our system is pretty heavily patrolled by mind flayers, so plan accordingly. And that's because our next subject, Glyph, is quite literally a bastion for that race. Glyph, when viewed from Toral, looks like a dull gray orb surrounded by a spectacular ring and orbited by three smaller bodies. Glyph is a rather harsh planet, but not only because of its inhabitants. At one point, it was covered in forests, but ever since the Illithids took over, they burned them to the ground. That's not to say all the forests are gone, however, just the ones they didn't have complete control over. Glyph is about 80% land, while the other 20% appears to be a strange gelatinous substance that contains a large amount of water. This substance is edible and actually quenches thirst in a similar way to water, but never turned brackish or never froze despite the awful atmosphere. When the Illithids burned down the planet's forests, this caused a massive amount of smoke to fill the atmosphere which in turn nearly totally destroyed the atmospheric envelope and brought about acidic rain. So, like I said, not a very nice place to explore by any means. But of course, none of this really seems to bother the Illithids. 
The satellites of Glyph include Haven, which is a hollowed out asteroid used as a neutral meeting place for rival Illithid factions. Mingabwe, which is a small moon that's surprisingly where other spacefaring races are welcome. It's practically empty, but is by far the best landing choice you have if you have to enter the sector. And one other moon called Polluter, which is covered in asteroid impacts and frozen water, but has no atmosphere to speak of. The rings of Glyth are pretty stock standard, consisting mostly of ice balls and small asteroids that orbit Glyth's equator. There's actually so much I could discuss regarding the Illithid society and what we know about it, but doing so would cause this entry to go over long, so let's move on to the next body. The seventh planet orbiting the sun goes by the name of Garden and is actually not even a planet. It's actually a cluster of Earth bodies linked together by a plant of titanic size called Yggdrasil's Child. This colossal spaceborne plant's roots anchor the many thousands of asteroids together forming a fairly cohesive planetary body. But if you're going by the strict definition of planet, it technically doesn't apply here, so I'll just be calling it a plant for the rest of this section. The plant's main trunk is woven together from several hundred smaller trunks and limbs, each of which have a radius of about 50 feet on average. The main trunk actually has its own gravity plane that bends around its surface. A gravity plane is essentially a geometric plane that encompasses large bodies in wild space, effectively giving Garden its own gravity field. The main trunk doesn't appear to lead anywhere, as you might expect from more standard trees, but there are some tales that say its trunks or roots grow straight through wild space and into other planes of existence. The bark of Garden is a scaly wood substance that's resistant to any damage from cold, electricity, and heat, and leaves are even bigger than the sails of many ships. By all accounts, Garden has been in existence for as long as spelljammers have been sailing realm space. Also, throughout history, some have assumed the plant itself was sentient and tried to communicate with it, but to no avail. Garden is orbited by 12 small moons, each with their own unique characteristics. They vary from perfectly spherical moons to airless rectangular moons. And as unique as each of these are, they aren't so interesting enough to go through each one. So let's move to the last primary celestial body in realm space. Katha is the eighth and farthest planet away from the sun, and seen from Toril, it appears as a crystalline glimmer of diamond white, but has also been reported to be emerald green from time to time. The planet consists of a flat 300 mile disk of clear water with a single solitary mountain at the very center. Close up, it would look like a giant wagon wheel with a mountain always pointing directly at the sun. The mountain, known as the Spindle, is over a thousand miles tall and is the tallest mountain in all of realm space. The summit of the Spindle is constantly covered in dark and stormy clouds which make it impenetrable to most forms of vision, and legend has it that whoever successfully climbs the Spindle, starting from the base, would be granted complete knowledge of the entire universe, but that's just a myth of course. Anyways, because of the planet's distance from the sun and the fact that its rotation keeps it always facing the sun, Katha's climate is cool with the temperature always at around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The disc world itself is entirely inhabited by different species of beholders who are constantly fighting against each other for supremacy of the spindle. At the base of the mountain, there are six ports, each owned by a different beholder type, and they're even known to accept spell jamming traffic from outsiders. Katha has two moons that orbit the planet at its equator, the closest moon being a spherical body with a highly flammable atmosphere that's kept in quarantine, and the farthest moon being metallic and roughly cylindrical in shape. Apparently this moon is hollow and serves as a wizard's laboratory with two doors at each end of the cylinder, 
but with all the beholders and mind flares trolling around, I don't know that I'd ever want to visit them. And that covers the primary celestial bodies of realm space. Now, I'm also aware of the existence of many, many other objects of note that reside in realm space. Everything from the far realm infested stars to the skull of the void. But if I tried to fit all of that in this entry, it'd never end. But I promise you we'll come back and look at the additional astronomical bodies here in realm space, and perhaps even the crystal shell itself. There's just so many fascinating things to be found here in realm space, so I highly doubt I'll ever run out of topics for these entries. But for now, this is your guide signing out. Be safe, take care, and happy trails.